Welcome everyone to the Union Federation podcast here on the Fandom Podcast Network where we discuss both Star Trek and the Orville here on the Fandom Podcast Network and we're really excited about this uh, latest series of Union Federation podcast because we are discussing Star Trek The Next Generation and we are discussing all of the eight two-parters throughout its seven season run uh, and uh, we're going to be discussing this little bad boy right here, Redemption Part 1 and 2. Look at that. Okay, well, I'm going to be your captain for this episode, and I'd like to introduce uh, the rest of the crew here. First of all, let's start with uh, my co-captain and security and weapons officer. Let's see if he's uh, down there shining all the bat lifts and the armory down there. Uh, let's welcome uh, Mr. Kyle Wagner. What's going on, buddy? I have come here to drink blood wine and celebrate over my defeated opponents after vicious games of checkers and tiddlywinks. All right. Well, just make sure you have some of that prune juice because we know a certain Klingon gets a little testy when he doesn't have it around. So. Uh, yeah, I got to keep know. things regular. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, uh, uh, with us uh, tonight is our uh, first officer and counselor and founder of the BQN. Please welcome the lovely Amy Nelson. Well, hello there. Um, I'm excited to be talking Redemption. You showed, gave me that quick little video, got me so excited. Yeah, I you like that? You have all the hard copies of everything. Physical media is important. It is. It definitely, definitely is. Uh, we want to give a shout out to Haley Stoddard, of course, our Oracle and Science Officer. She couldn't be here with us, but she will join us again. Uh, she's been, been real busy with work and we're thinking about her. So uh, uh, um, Haley, I oh, hope to see you guys soon. So as I mentioned, um, we're having a lot of fun right now with this kind of limited series podcast that we're doing here on the Fandom Podcast Network. And one of the things we want to do, of course, is celebrate Star Trek The Next Generation. And with this uh, nine episode limited series, we're, we're going to be covering, first of all, all of the eight episodes that uh, were uh, kind of are a, a very important character of the whole series because uh, it really kind of helped, you know, not invent, but to re, you know, kind of energize the whole two-parter episode thing. And some of them were, of course, you know, season season uh, cliffhangers, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And then, of course, the ninth podcast that we're going to be doing is we're going to look at all of them, and we're going to cover the ratings that IMDb did on them with our own, and also maybe peek into the other two-part uh, episodes that uh, we also enjoyed in the other uh, Star Trek series as well. And one of the things, too, guys, uh, that you may not know is that this is this is the twenty this is the was it twenty thirtieth anniversary of when Star Trek: The Next Generation left us. Um, but before we go any further on that, though, uh, Amy, you are with the BQN, and I was wondering if you could uh, give a little tease of what's happening over there. Well, we are uh, just doing our infinite diversities, covering Prodigy. All good things is still going strong. We're going to be starting the view screen, our YouTube uh, program in September. Trexpert's quiz is coming back strong. They've already had two amazingly wonderful, difficult, I might say, shows uh, that have just come on after the summer. And uh, we're going to be starting our uh, food replicator our cooking show uh, that's going to be coming up soon. So we've got a lot going on. So check us out at BQN. Very cool. Very cool. Kyle. I was just going to say, when is Gordon Ramsay going to be on your cooking show? Because <laughs> that, when he, he has to review the Klingon food, food thing, that's going to be just perfect for him. That's the best thing about Star Trek is there's so much to podcast and discuss about it. You know, yes. there's so many angles to explore. So, yeah. And we wanted to obviously fill the nostalgia of us missing Star Trek The Next Generation. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about every uh, two part episode uh, throughout its, its seven series. And uh, if you're watching on the podcast here on, uh, on YouTube, uh, this we just last week we recorded The Best of Both Worlds Part One and Two. And this week we're doing Redemption Part 1 and 2. And coming up, we've got uni Unification, Time's Arrow, Chain of Command, Birthright, Descent, and Gambit Part 1 and 2, followed by the final episode, uh, kind of wrapping everything up. Um, now, I did want to mention, too, that uh, one of the things that inspired me to do this, other than this great article that we're going to get to in a second, is uh, it has been... 30 years, guys, since uh, Star Trek ended its television run uh, when we had the uh, series finale of All Good Things on May 23rd, 1994. 
and uh, we thought it would be a good time to celebrate that anniversary uh, by also bringing it back. So <laughs> there you go. And if you're watching here on the YouTube, of course, we've got all the listing of what years and uh, when these two parters started and ended. And uh, it started with 1990 with Best of Both Worlds and gave us the cliffhanger uh, going into um, uh, later in the year, 1990. And so we're going to get more into that a little bit later. But uh, first, let's get into the first away mission here, guys. And let's get into the Admiral's Log. And uh, Amy, I thought you would go ahead and give us the Admiral's Log for the, uh, the Redemption Part 1 and Redemption Part 2. All right. Well, Redemption Part 1 was the summer cliffhanger airing June 15th, 1991. Man, remember when we'd get new episodes all the way into June? No, anymore. God, 26 episodes all hour long. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Captain Jean-Luc Picard um, as Kempek's chosen arbiter of succession and the Enterprise D are asked to attend the installation of Gowron as the Chancellor of the Klingon High Council. Gowron, Gowron informs Picard that the House of Duras will challenge Gowron's position and it may lead to a Klingon civil war. Meanwhile, Worf requests a leave of absence to visit his brother Kern, who controls a small fleet of birds of prey, and to urge him to back Gowron, as once installed as chancellor, Gowron can reinstate their family name. Interrupting the ceremony, the Duras sisters present their deceased brother's illegitimate son, Toral, who has the lineage to challenge Gowron. Picard is called on to determine Torrell's candidacy. The Duras sisters try to influence Picard. He in turn remarks that if he finds for Torrell, Gowron will soon be dead. But if he finds for Gowron, Torrell will lead a call for a rebellion against Gowron. At the restart of the ceremony, relying on Klingon law, Picard comes to the conclusion that Toral lacks the experience to lead and secures Gowron's candidacy. This, however, prompts a majority of the council members to abandon Gowron. Gowron returns to his ship to meet with Worf, who offers his brother's fleet support in exchange for the return of his family name to honor. Gowron initially refuses, but they are attacked by two ships loyal to the House of Doros. Worf and the arrival of Kern's fleet dispatch the attackers. Picard completes the rite and installs Gowron as chancellor. Gowron restores Worf's family honor. Gowron and the Enterprise crew learn that the Dora sisters are assembling a fleet to incite a civil war. As the Federation cannot get involved in internal affairs, Worf resigns his commission from Starfleet to assist Gowron and Kern. As the Enterprise evacuates the area before fighting begins, Toral and the Dura sisters consider Picard a coward, but their Romulan ally, a woman bearing an uncanny resemblance to the late Tasha Yar, emerges from the shadows and warns them that Picard may return. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what a way to end that, uh, that uh, cliffhanger right there, right? Kyle. Yeah. We need to talk about that because she came like a commercial before. And you will talk about that. Well, I'm just going to say, one yes. of the most, what the freaking triple endings ever for an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, because it was going everywhere. And I mean, if since we're talking like Worf resigning, like we sort of knew Picard wasn't really going to die because he's the main, but Worf, he's like a secondary character. And it's like, oh my gosh, is he like going to leave and, and be Klingon? Like to me, that was a big question that I had. Yeah. Yes. All right. So what do you got next? Well, uh, we had to wait till September 21st, 1991. Oh, it took forever. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So Picard is aware that while he cannot get involved in the Klingon Civil War, the Romulans will likely see it as an opportunity to gain an advantage over the Federation. He assembles a fleet of ships to create a blockade between the Klingon and the Romulan border. Many of the Enterprise crew are assigned temporary command of severely undermanned ships. 
Picard initially does not assign Lieutenant Commander Data command of a ship, but after Data questions him about the omission, he gives him the Sutherland. Picard arranges the fleet to form a detection network that should observe any cloaked ships that pass the blockade. Commander Sela, the Romulan resembling Yar, orders her scientists to find a way to disable the network, but also contacts the Enterprise. Sela reveals that she is the daughter of Tasha Yar, who returned to the past on the Enterprise C 24 years earlier, if you remember yesterday's Enterprise. Sela warns that if Starfleet does not break off the blockade in 20 hours, their fleet will be attacked. Meanwhile, Worf is kidnapped by the Doros sisters, who attempt to seduce him to join their cause by marrying Bator. By Worf scratching his head. <laughs> <laughs> Worf declines, obviously, stating that honor would be subverted and the Klingon Empire would quickly fall to Romulan control. Seeing the cause is defeated, Sela orders Worf to be turned over to the Romulan guard. Picard urges Gowron to attack the Doros forces who are running low on supplies. This will force the Romulans to enter the detection network and be caught by Starfleet. Gowron agrees, knowing that association with the Romulans will destroy the Doros family support and end the Civil War. The Doros sisters demand the Romulans bring supplies. Sela's scientists find they can disrupt part of the network, by sending out an energy burst. Sela initiates the plan, selecting the Sutherland as a target. When the network destabilizes, Picard orders the fleet to retreat and reform the net, but Data observes that he can trace the source of the disruption. He orders the firing of torpedoes at specific coordinates, revealing the Romulan ships. The convoy retreats and the Dura sisters are forced to end the civil war. Worf breaks free in time to secure Toral, but the Dura sisters escape. Gowron gives Worf the opportunity to kill Toral by right of vengeance, but he declines to do so because Toral was just a puppet of his aunt's. Sparing Toral's life, Worf asks Picard to be reinstated into Starfleet to which Picard gladly agrees. Nice. Well done there. And also, too, you know, you get the uh, the data going in saying, submitting himself for, uh, you know, um, you know, I was a bad boy and stuff like that. And yeah. Picard, Picard's like, nah, you're good. Anyway, we'll get into that a little bit later. So well done. Thank you very much for that, Amy. A lot of stuff to go there. A lot of stuff happens oh, wow. in this two-parter. A lot, lot of, uh, you know, you know, weaving threads in here so i wanted to make sure that we definitely uh, got a full synopsis there so one thing before we get into stuff here i did want to mention about the blu-ray release there's uh as these um during this time when they were re-releasing the uh the blu-rays of all the seasons and back here i've got a couple of them here i've got of course uh you know season four right here and then of course season five is when uh redemption part two kicks in uh, they were uh, releasing these two parters on uh, Blu-ray here, and I, I did. I had uh, last year's best or last week's best, best of both worlds, and this was a cool little thing here. And um, they uh, released this. I think it was July thirtieth, twenty thirteen, and uh, there was uh, some great interview highlights on this. And I haven't done enough research to find out where else you can find the these special features, like if they're on. I don't, when I look on the Blu-rays for the seasons, I don't see these listed. These are specific for this two-part episode, but you got a great interviews with Robert O'Reilly, with Galron, Gwyneth Walsh, who played Bator, of course, Michael Dorn with Lieutenant Worf, uh, Larry Nemechek, Ronald D. Moore, uh, the writer, uh, Dan Curry, the visual spec, uh, the visual effects supervisor. And what's really cool, guys, is that he was the original Batlift designer. And I had to pull my Batlift down from... Uh, here, check this out right here. And he talked about his inspiration for this thing and how he came about doing it. And uh, it was really neat because he kind of feels a certain pride of uh, introducing Klingon uh, culture. And then um, longtime Star Trek stunt coordinator, Dennis Danger Madalone talked about, thought it was silly at first and then like found ways to use it and train the actors to do it. It was great. 
also uh, music composer Ron Jones. And uh, one of the coolest things, too, is they saved it towards the end. Denise Crosby comes on and talks about uh, her part and that she kind of she came up with this idea, actually, to come back and submitted this idea uh, to Ronald Moore. And she was inspired by the movie um, Dances with Wolves, which had come out. And uh, Mary's character in that uh, gets indoctrinated into, she's a white woman that gets indoctrinated, of course, into the Indian culture there, the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And she liked that idea. And she submitted, like, she would have been the baby of the um, uh, the character that she fell in love with in Yesterday's Enterprise. I'm forgetting that guy's name. Otherwise known as Shooter McGavin from a, a certain movie that some of us may know. Um, and, uh, but she, they kind of took the idea and said, we'd like this, but we're going to change it. We're going to make it that your mother was a concubine and so on and so forth. But it was a really neat thing. And, and that she got to be part of that. Uh, did you guys ever get your hands on any of this physical media when it was coming out at the time, Amy, anyone? Well, I had purchased the DVD, you know, we talked about last week, the, mm -hmm. you know, the entire seasons and, uh, a lot of those interviews are on the DVD set, like that Dan Curry, um, the Batleth design. I Not definitely remember that. Like, so there are um, a lot of duplicates on there, but um, I'm wondering, I don't, I don't remember learning about that Denise Crosby. So that might be specific to the uh, Blu-ray, but yeah, yeah, I had just finished purchasing all seven se seasons and then they come out with these special two-parters and i'm like oh, i just i couldn't do it they didn't do the two-parters for everything and we'll get into that and reveal right. that later uh but uh they did for a few of them uh, yeah. kyle do you remember these at all coming out uh, were you ever tempted to, to get these two parts or were you kind of like just a season guy you know waiting for the blu-ray uh, i was kind of i was kind of more of this of the season guy um you know what? I honestly don't remember seeing too many of these two parters on the shelves, except for Best of Both Worlds. That was like the one. That was really yeah. the one that stood out. That was the first one, yeah. And then, of course, they did the theatrical release. I don't remember a theatrical release for this one. Yeah. Uh, I don't uh, for that one. But uh, yeah, we'll get into those a little bit later. But uh, one of the things that inspired this podcast, guys, is I found this great article here uh, by Dan, uh, by Dalton Norman uh, at Screen Rant, and he published this back in 2022 where he was ranking every two-part episode. And uh, I wanted to get into uh, what he said about Redemption Part 1 and 2. Uh, providing to be the perfect fodder for two-parters, Redemption brings together both the Klingons and the Romulans for one of the most intense stories of the series. Worf's allegiance are put to the test when the Klingon Empire descends into a bloody civil war, deciding to leave the Federation behind. Worf goes off to fight for his family name. Meanwhile, Captain Picard unravels a Romulan plot that may be the heart of the entire conflict. Worf's emotional journey throughout the story is gripping and is genuinely shocking to see him turn his back on the Federation. As always, uh, the dastardly Romulans proved to be the tricky adversaries uh, when it was ultimately Picard's insistence on peace that saves the day. As the name implies, Worf is out for a measure of redemption, and he earns some respect within his community because of his selflessness. So I want to kind of get your guys' reaction to that article synopsis here. We'll get into, of course, some more uh, specific topics, though. But I thought that was kind of a good uh, summary of what this kind of was happening. I'll start with you, Amy. You know, one thing that redemption has way more than any other is the strategy. And like the strategy to me, it, it's clear, but it's sneaky. And even in part one, you know, after they sort of, uh, he's talking to, uh, I can't remember which Klingon, and he's like, this smells a lot like Romulan strategies going on here, <laughs> you know? And, but I love that because it is, it's clear. I understand it because sometimes I'm just going to say, like um, Deep Space Nine with the, the Dominion and even when uh, Cisco in the Pelman line, I don't know. There's some, he makes some kind of decision. I don't know what it is, but this one is very clear. You know the Klingons, they're using the Romulans. The Romulans are trying to gain power of the quadrant. So they, like, it's just strategy 101 and I absolutely love it. And again, 
we get to see these visuals of the ships attacking. I see the ships. I love the barricade and like the mathematical, that's all networks and graph theory um, and the detection. And it's like brilliant. I just think it is such a smart, uh, well-written two-parter that really gets to the heart. And we're learning so much about the Klingons and the Romulans and that they could work together, you know, because we always hear Worf saying Romulans have no honor and da, da, da. But if the circumstances are right, they are going to work together. So there's always this undertow where you've got to watch the Klingons. You got to watch the Romulans. And this two-parter just exemplifies that. What about you, Kyle? I think the most intriguing thing about this two-parter, and I think it's actually one of the best times that Next Generation really does play, not only do you have the action, but like Amy said, you have the political intrigue. You're really seeing a lot of things behind the scenes going on. One of my favorite moments in this in these two episodes is when Picard is meeting with Duras, the Duras sisters. Mm. And he's kind of wrapped up, and he kind of just looks at them and says, I must commend you about how your approach was so Romulan and you can just see the look <laughs> on their faces. Yeah. And he says that like, Oh crap. And yeah. I, it was a great moment, but I mean, the other, the other aspect of it is, is what I, again, with this two parter with all the different angles and intrigue you're taking, there's some great character moments throughout Worf obviously has a big center stage. Picard has a big center stage. But just some great data moments mm -hmm. as well. And it's really, it's one of the better Trek two-parters that covers a lot of ground and still giving everybody a really good chance to, to shine and really setting up a lot of different angles within it that's so weaved together at the end that it's, it's so well done. Wow. Yeah. The great comments, guys. I, I agree with that. There was, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I know people that don't like Klingons and they just tend to go by the Klingon episodes and they, they have their reasons. And, you know, when it comes to the original series, we, we, we got kind of um, a certain look at them. But what I loved about TNG is the culture that they put them, the politics they put behind them. Uh, but still made them Klingons and made them, you know, fierce and, you know, territorial, of course, and, you know, honor this. But, you know, they a lot of them hide behind, uh, they, they have treachery hiding behind the honor, which I also find fascinating as well. And, but I wanted to, uh, let, let's go ahead and since we're, we're on this, um, uh, we're on this first away mission, I want to get into the first topic here, guys. I want to take you back. Let's go ahead. <laughs> One of the things, yes, Kyle. I just wanted to hit on something real quick before we jumped into this that you talked about. I want to throw this out there because I think Star Trek The Next Generation, more than any other Star Trek show, defined the Klingons. Hmm. Because if you yeah. think about it, Next Gen was already coming out when Undiscovered Country came out. And look how different the Klingons were in that film compared yeah. to previous films mm -hmm. before Next Generation. Yeah, Good definitely. It, that yeah. That's one of the things that was just, it, they just... You know, and plus you had a character that was Klingon, so you had to you had to explore that. You had to give that. And uh, I'm going to get into Worf's uh, saga in a moment here, but I want to take you back, guys, to when you remember first seeing this this two parter. And you know, keep in mind. So this is the second um, summer cliffhanger, so to speak. And this is where the Worf saga really starts to kind of uh, take hold. But I want to take you back a little bit, guys, because going into this redemption here, I was like, wait a minute. I need to go back to a couple of episodes first. And the two that I went to was uh, the season three episode, um, episode 17 called Sins of the Father. And this is where a Klingon commander comes aboard the Enterprise in an officer exchange program initiated by Starfleet, much to the chagrin of the crew. Of course, this is Tony Todd playing what we find out is Worf's brother, Kern. Uh, so this is a bit, this is really where Worf's character arc really starts to kind of take um, a, a notch up in, in his, his character. 
And then you have to go to earlier in season four before this first part cliffhanger episode seven reunion. When the leader of the Klingon high council dies, Picard finds himself in the middle of the struggle of a now vacant position. Meanwhile, Worf reunites with his past love, Kalor, only to find now that he has a new son. And we get hints of Romulan activity here because a Romulan bomb was used in the attempted assassination plot when uh, a brilliant strategy to try to find out who's going to take over as the new chancellor with Kalor's help, we get um, Picard deciding to go back to use some old Klingon. Let's see how good you are and how, you know, what kind of past battles that you won in, in this older ceremony, much to the chagrin of, uh, of Duras and um, um, uh, what's his Calron. name? Calron. Calron, thank you. And this is where we get uh, Picard as the arbiter of successor. So this is where. Worf's character and the Klingon cultural events, as you touched on, Kyle, really start to take shape before we get into this two-parter. So going into this, I want to know what you know of what you've seen of this previous Klingon episodes, having this 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 uh, cliffhanger of like, is Worf leaving? What's going on? Romulans, what? Amy, I want to start with you. Yeah, that was the thing I was saying, like, you know, you sort of knew Picard wasn't going to die as a Borg because he's the captain. And back then, you just didn't kill your main characters. And, you know, if you're looking at it like, you know, there's Riker and Data that's a higher command. So Worf, he's sort of a secondary character. And you're like, he's leaving. He's got his brother. He's always complaining that... He wants to learn more about Klingons. And I really did think this was it, that we're going to lose it. I mean, we already lost one security officer, Tasha Yar. She died. So why not lose another? This could have been a thing. So this one, as far as like reality, I was scared about this one. And, but then I, when you were going back like Sins of the Father and like Emissary and uh, Kalar, like remember when Picard was his Chadich and, you know, yeah. was helping him then like the relationship that Worf and Picard build through this entire Klingon saga is so beautiful. And he Picard even mentions that he was Chadich before. So, again, calling back to the previous time that he has stood by Worf. And then for Worf to be leaving like that, it just hurt even more because of that so well-developed relationship between Picard and, and Worf. So this, th this two-parter, and, and I just also want to ask you guys, I didn't feel that this, I'm they're connected, but I felt like they were two separate episodes where like best of both worlds that was like one continuation did you guys feel that like i felt like the second episode with your data like there was more starfleet and stepped back from the full klingonness of it that that's because that, you're absolutely right it had that feel and what's funny is you remember in the last week's episode of best of both worlds part one and two i watched the movie as it was cut yes. together as a movie well i took the time to actually watch it episode by episode so i felt that uh that cliffhanger thing going on mm -hmm. and you're right it takes a different tone you still have all the klingon stuff going on but because of the whole thing with sila yeah and the romulan thing because she's trying to kind of shock picard and one make them kind of like you know pull back a little bit and not see what she's really trying to do what about you kyle well, well, first of all, I just want to say with Amy talking about the security officers and, you know, Tasha dying and maybe Worf dying, the decision for Michael Dorn to return to Star Trek Enterprise or, or to the Enterprise as Worf really messed things up for poor Guy Fleegman. You know, he, he ended up having to go to Galaxy Quest instead. <laughs> <laughs> a sliding doors <laughs> moment there. <laughs> Guy Fleegman, is that his name? <laughs> <laughs> Sam Rockwell's character. That's <laughs> But. No, I, I think that, that's one of the good things about this two. I think about this two part episode is with the first part being so heavy on Klingon and really dealing with everything building up with Ward, which again, I'm going to say this I think 
the Worf Klingon storyline in Next Generation, and then the storylines they did with Worf in DS9. Michael Dorn has had two of some of the best storylines to work with in Star Trek history. And yeah. what was so great, this is this is when two we see we kind of saw in the previous two part where they really elevate Riker in, in Best of Both Worlds. This is where they elevate Worf. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's something that they figured out as they were going along is like, let's give everybody a chance and have some episodes that elevate them. And I think across the board, that's one of the reasons why next generation is so successful because they find those episodes to elevate them. And in this Worf's case, because it's so powerful because you're talking, not only are you dealing with Klingon tradition and things of honor and the, the political stakes, but then to kind of shift things a little bit and having it be from, Yes, you're seeing what's going on inside the Klingons, but you're also seeing how Starfleet has to react to this and the maneuvering by Picard to get Starfleet involved but not involved was so genius. And it, it was, it's one of those moments where you're just like, yeah, the, 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 this is why Picard is one of the greatest captains in Starfleet history because it's just brilliant. Well said, Kyle. And one of the th- things that jumped out at me too was the relationship between Car- Picard and Worf and him being there, being his Jadich and becoming the Arbiter successor. And really kind of, you know, in, in the second episode too, he, he's like trying to back away from it too, which is interesting. But uh, I, I love the relationship between those two guys and the honor that they share, share each other. Uh, did you have a comment you want to say, Amy? Well, I just wanted to uh, point out that this episode was the first one that really challenged my idea of a different timeline because yesterday's Enterprise, I was totally fine. Send Tashi Yar back because that's a different universe. You know, that's a different timeline. But no, it's not a different timeline. And this episode like blew my mind. I did not even think of these timelines being the prime timeline. Right. Um, That's it a good just, point. That's an excellent point. <laughs> this one, yeah, it blew what? In the, <laughs> the, yeah. To, the, I, and I remember explaining it to my mother too, because she didn't uh, get it. We were like, okay. What's so you're not alone there, Amy. There's a, uh, a, a there's a a star regular on the Enterprise that was in interviewed in this, and that's Michael Dorn himself. <laughs> cannot understand any of the Sela stuff. He's like, I don't understand any of that. I, I don't. It was cool <laughs> to see her. It was great to have her, but I don't get it. It's yeah. it's kind of funny, and and it, it's it was one of the funny things that's funny because he's not the only one. We're like, wait a minute, Enterprise. Uh, okay, she went the back. She did what? Wait, what? Huh? But you're right. It does. It's tiny whiny. It, it yep. messes with you a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish there wasn't a blue, uh, blue police box floating around somewhere in space around this episode. Somewhere. <laughs> well, guys, let's get into a little bit of Star Trek trivia. All right. Let's start with a little part one trivia. And uh, I'll go ahead and start off. And then Amy, followed by you. And then uh, Kyle. And then we'll wrap it around. So part one trivia, 1991, former President Ronald Reagan visited the set during filming of this episode. After being introduced to several actors dressed in full Klingon warrior garb, Reagan was asked what he thought of the Klingons. He says, I like them. He said, they remind me of Congress. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think... uh... Congress has overseeded the Klingons now. They're <laughs> they're meaner. <laughs> All right, Amy. Now, according to Michael Pillar, the redemption story arc was initially conceived as the cliffhanger for the third season, but was delayed for a year, obviously, to make way for best of both worlds. That's Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's been claimed, for example, on Reddit that Gowron never blinks. Oh, so not true. He does in this episode at the 15 minute, 25 second mark. I forgot to look for the Gowron blink. Darn it. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I've seen him blink. That's funny. <laughs> uh, the revealing costumes for the Dura sisters designed by Robert Blackman were quickly dubbed Klingon cleavage among fans. According to the production staff, neither actress used chest padding. 
<laughs> that is true. Um, <laughs> I did ask her that question uh, when they when you say to, her, who are you referring to? Both of them. They were sitting uh, next to each other at the, in the vendor's room at, at Star Trek Las Vegas many years ago. Nice. And nice. Uh, we were going to try and get them for an interview, but they declined to come on our podcast. Um, but we did ask because I was raving I've always, it's always been this, you know, fantasy to dress up like, you know, one of them. Yeah. And they're like, nope, it was all us. Like, <laughs> oh, <my> goodness. <laughs> all right. Well, Tom Ormany was credited as Klingon first officer, but became a name in the official Star Trek customizable card game, Crom. I, uh, I I can confirm that because I used to work for that company. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, go ahead and start off part two trivia for us. Picard mentions the starship Akagi and Hornet. These were the names of two aircraft carriers that fought against each other at the World War II Naval Battle of Midway. Nice. Like it that. is revealed that Data has served in Starfleet for 26 years at this point. Amy? And this is the 100th episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. So do you think they brought out like a big cake and you had all the Klingon actors like trying to hold cake and eat it? I mean, how did that work out, you think? <laughs> I'm sure there was a very large cake. <laughs> Kyle. Footage of the Klingon bird of prey flying towards the sun is reused from Star Trek for The Voyage Home. Nice. Okay. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get into the cast discussion here because we got some guest, guest stars that we definitely need to talk about. Okay, so guys, we have, of course, our, uh, our regular crew, as we know. But uh, we've got Tony Todd as Kern, and of course, we've got Robert, Robert O'Reilly as Galron, uh, Barbara March as Lursa, Gwyneth Walsh as Bator. Uh, we've got uh, Nicholas Kepros as General Movar, the uh, Romulan. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg, of course, uh, is, is with us as well. Uh, and uh, we also then at the we're gonna, I'm going to save the Denise Crosby Sela discussion for the part two. But I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on the cast, especially the Klingon guys that we got going on here. Amy, I want to start with you. You know, Kern is just wonderful. And especially in this two-parter, because in part one, Worf Source has to play big brother and, oh, don't you even think about it. I'm the big brother. You're going to follow me. We're going to support Gowron and you're going to bring all your buddies with you. And I have spoken and then flip it to part two. And Tony Todd, like he stands up to Worf. He and Michael Dorn, like they are truly brothers. My gosh, they there's not one that's over dominating the great chemistry. And uh, now Worf is like, well, I don't really like Gowron. And it's Kern that's like, uh, you told me we're going to support Gowron and it's it. We're doing it and we're going all the way. So get in line, buddy. And I love that dynamic between the two brothers. And Tony Todd is just brilliant. Nice. Nice. Kyle, any thoughts on the cast for uh, episode Redemption Part 1? Well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Tony Todd love. Because, uh, he, I mean, this is a guy who has been in Hollywood for a very long time. Has definitely found his niche within the horror genre of films. Famous for being in the Candyman films. Um but he's just a phenomenal actor, and he is so good as Kern in this that you, if you don't give him his credit, you're missing out. Um, but I got I love Robert O'Reilly as Garon because not only does he have such an interesting look with the makeup on and everything like that, but there's just something about him. He just comes across, and you just feel so sleazy about him. But yet, there's something about him too with just you know restoring War's honor family name and everything like that you kind of want to root for him too and it, it, i think it's, that's what makes him such a unique klingon it's like there's minutes you just want to hate the guy and punch him out and there's other times it's like, yeah okay i'm i'm in camp gowron again and it's, <laughs> it, it's kind of like you're in you're out um the other thing i, I just gotta throw out a quick thing to whoopi goldberg because um yeah i i want her on my back when it's time to start shooting <laughs> phasers 
because she's good yeah. apparently yeah, yeah. <laughs> apparently guy and and knows it oh, oh only level 14 <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I want to give it up to the Dura sisters here. Uh, uh, yet, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny too because uh, I, I come at it from a, a gaming perspective as well. I remember when their characters were re released on the Star Trek Cusple card game for Decipher, and they were always fun to put into uh, Klingon uh, decks. And of course, they they both had treachery, and they're just one of the most iconic Klingons of all time. In that they're part of the the, the Dura. Um, uh, treacherous family and stuff like that. And what's interesting too is uh, Toral, uh, played by JD Cullum, by the way. Uh, and for those of you that don't know JD Cullum, he's been he's been working a working actor for a while. And I had to kind of look him up. And he actually there is a tie to the Orville here. Is that uh, he worked with Seth MacFarlane in the TED TV series. Uh, he was a, a character on there, but man, did I just want to slap that Klingon and kick him to the ground. He was so annoying. He may have had the, the male blood right to be the next uh, successor, but you know, when he's saying that, you know, even when seal is like dressing him down, like shut him up, you know, it's just like, Oh, he was so annoying, but he was good at being annoying though. Uh, and I, and I loved uh, general Movar as uh, the, the, the other Romulan that's scheming as well. So, but uh, yeah, so all right, guys, let's let's get into uh, part two here. Uh, and one of the things that I did want to talk about before we talk talk about Sela, uh, and of course, um, you know Denise Crosby's return here, guys. I did want to uh, talk about um, Data. We brought him up before. This yeah. was a really good Data episode, and more specifically. He's given command of the Sutherland, which I thought was great. Uh, but of course, he has this commanding officer uh, questioning everything, and he's being a, an asshole about it. And Data's Data puts him in his place, and this whole tachyon uh, grid thing. It was the way that it was described. It was great because you didn't have to be an expert in uh, any type of like math or field, and even though you are. Amy, and maybe you can touch on that a little bit more. I thought this was a fantastic way to create this net or this web mm -hmm. to try to stop or expose the Romulans. And it's data that uh, was able to do this with what he was able to pick up and do this. Amy, I want you to kind of speak to this a little bit. Yeah. So the, that, uh, will you put the graphic back up there? Um, Thank you. That's called a closed network. Um, it's not complete, uh, but it is getting close to it. And when you've got those lines going from like each verte vertices, which represents a ship, um, that's going and that's what creates that network. I mean, it literally is a network and they call it a net. So I just freaking love that. Um, it's taken me back. And can we talk about... Um, data in command um, because his first officer that did not want to be there um i freaking love lieutenant him. commander christopher hobson hobson yes <laughs> and he is uh played timothy carhart who i know from hunt from red october Yep, and uh -huh. Thelma and Louise, and he played a in, villain in um, uh, um, Beverly Hills Cop Three. As well. Yes, that's yeah. right. So um, he's been in really quite a lot, um, but his again most memorable is here because what an a hole he is to Data <laughs> and prejudice. You know, yeah. he does not want to work for a an android and. Yeah. He lays it all out there. And, you know, to be fair, he's got his points and his reasons. And Data, bless his heart. I don't know if Brent meant to play it that way, but I almost feel that there's some hatred boy underneath, just boiling underneath the surface there. And I know he doesn't because all the time he's like, um, that's not the correct procedure. Um, so then he fixes everything and he's like, now do A, B, C. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I said to do. But the proper procedure was to go through me that I give the command. I just, yeah. that dialogue, the leadership that you can talk about between those two, um, is just so beautiful and so 
rich of context and, and so much we could say, but I right. will. Yeah. Kyle. What I think is interesting about this particular part of the storyline, one, Brett Spiner is fantastic in, in this, but I got to give a lot of love to Timothy Carhart here because I I think as much as he's being a jerk, mm -hmm. he has valid, he, he has, there's points he has and how he portrays them is valid. Here's a human being seeing a machine, quote unquote, a machine coming like in. the rate, the radiation thing that was brought yeah, up. Yeah. The right? radiation yeah. thing. He has like, yeah. has a machine who has is emotional. It's going to care about, you know, us human crew. And let's talk about, he, he made data, the first Android captain in Starfleet history under some very intense circumstances here too. I think it's a very human reaction. Like, you know, whether, whether you're prejudiced, whether you're prejudiced or not, or not, I think it is human because you don't know what to expect. He had, they haven't served with data. They've only heard about data. So they don't know. And here's a guy who, He's putting his concerns and his well-being for the crew of the ship that are his friends. That's his concern. Now he's handling it not the best way, but there's a ring of truth to that portrayal that I think was so well done. And I do think you see it. Brent Spiner starting to show a little emotion out of Data because when you see Data getting almost frustrated when he refuses to fire on the Romulan ships mm -hmm. yeah. and his, how his voice infliction changes in there. That's when we're starting to see those little moments of emotion from data. And can I just interject real quick, but fast forward to Picard season three, this is the initial stage of, we don't like androids. We don't like the F eights. Remember right, um, right. that beginning yeah. of Picard, that suspicion all starts with this episode. That's a good thing. And plus, you know, I, I'm sure people have heard about data, but they don't know how to interact with them and, and yeah. you know, maybe look at them as more of a two dimensional character. And so Kyle, that's a great point. I never really thought about that. I, I just love it when like um, Hobson uh, makes a request and uh, data considers it for a second and goes denied. <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> it's just, he kind of puts him in his place there, but I, I did want to, yeah. I, I wanted to touch that first, but guys, Let's talk about let's let's talk about uh, um, the reveal of Celia here, and we also get a really good moment between uh, her and Picard when she comes aboard, and and she kind of explains what happened. And but we get Tasha, we get someone that looks like Tasha Yar, but we get Denise Crosby back into Star Trek, and I just wanted to get your guys's a uh, feeling and. First, you know, going like, holy crap, is that really her? Why is she dressed like a Romulan? Is that Tasha? I want to kind of go back in time to when you first saw this for the first time and how this played out in the second part of Redemption Part 2. Amy, start with you. Yeah, so we see her as the audience. We see her not at the end of Part 1, but like an entire commercial before. So it's like we see her at the end, but then we have this whole She's time. she's in shadow though and you hear the yes. voice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we know who she is, you know. <laughs> do we? But, do we? Do we ever well? Do we know? Yes. Know. <laughs> but what I loved in watching this again for this episode in preparation because Troy very limited. We don't get a lot of Jordy Troy or Beverly. Uh, but Troy's one point is like, you know, you can't just assume that she's telling lies. I mean, yeah. and Troy reveals like she believes what she says. She believes she, you know, so we need to not discount her. And, you know, what was interesting um, when Picard was like, it could be a million things. They could have cloned her. They could. And all those things that he was saying totally reminded me of what happens in nemesis and what they created Shinzon. He yeah. was a clone to rapidly grow and to, you know, try and take over like that. Again, that idea was started here for that movie and nemesis. And I was like, Oh, I love it. Before I forget too, I, I was reminded too, that the last time that we saw the Dura sisters and generations and yeah. you know, how, you know, they're, they're spying and getting Jordy to do the stuff. And then like, like, ew, those are human females. <laughs> so anyway, it's, I, I'm going on a tangent there. Yeah. Uh, but Kyle, I wanted to get your first reaction. Like, you know, when you were watching uh, 
Denise Crosby come back as Sila, and then the um, the the more character development we got of that character in part two of Redemption. So I, I think the first thing we have to address here is when you go back to that time frame, there was no way in hell anybody thought Denise Crosby was going to show up again on Star Trek The Next Generation after the way she left and the reason why she left. Well, and, and she got her time on yesterday's Enterprise. So it's like, all right, we've, we've seen yeah. her. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's one of those things where, okay, fences mended and they bring her back. And then to see her in the, in this position, you're like, it's 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 mind blowing in the sense that in that in the moment that you just thought no way there, there there was no way, and then like we talked about a little earlier, the explanation for it is just there are like you know, like you said, Michael Dorn's is like I still don't understand it, and there are a lot of people out there who haven't wrapped their minds around that explanation. I get, I think I get a little bit of a headache trying to figure it out, but <laughs> for for being a cliffhanger like that. In 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 its own way, it's all it's it's powerful. It's just in, as powerful as Picard becoming Locutus, and in the aspect of the shock and awe value side of it, and to 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 see Denise Crosby, who a lot of people, a lot of Star Trek fans really loved, and were very sad to see her go, and thought, okay, well, we had yesterday's Enterprise. That's kind of like a proper farewell now for Denise Crosby. But then we have this and everybody's like going, what the hell is she like? And I remember at the time, everybody was speculating, well, is she going to come back? Is she going to be part of the regular cast now? What, what, what What's, what's going to happen here? And it led to a, a lot of people talking about it. Maybe not quite in the way, you know, it the way of best both worlds ends, but it had people talking. So it's a, was a brilliant marketing strategy and a brilliant move by, by the creators of Star Trek and the writers of these episodes to do this, and when you and then you when you pick it back up and see her character, and you realize at the end of this episode we are not done with this character yet. She is going to be back, and you're like, okay, what are the ramifications of this going forward? Yeah, because yeah. because Kevin and you'll appreciate this. There are a lot of people out there who will say Denise Crosby leaving Star Trek was one of the most, I don't want to I hate put it in this way, but it's bonehead decisions in Hollywood history until, Ter until Terrence Howard came along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, Iron Man uh, two reference there. Yeah. Yeah. No, good call, Kyle. And it's, uh, I loved, I loved this, this, uh, this twist, I guess, basically. And, um, you know, when I finally started to figure out, you know, wait, your daughter of who and how, and then, oh, yesterday's Enterprise, which I always felt yesterday's Enterprise deserved to be a two-parter. I wish mm -hmm. that was a two-parter because it was just one of the most well-written, mm -hmm. like, single standalone episodes of all time. But it made you want more of how well that it was done. But I love De Denise Crosby's turn in this. It's just a great character. And also, too, what I liked about this character and the Romulans we were really starting. We were always we always learned to never distrust the Romulans, but now that there was this um, alliance between the Federation and the Klingons, now the Romulans were the bad guys. They were and they were good bad guys. They were slimy, but they weren't like dumb at all. They were right. written really well. They looked cool. They had their own culture as well, and that got you know flushed out even more later on, and when you have really cool, especially with um, the great uh, episode where um, uh, Troy has to um, uh, become one of them and, you know, learn among them. And, 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 and uh, I'm sorry, what was the name of the episode again? I mean, face to the enemy. Yeah. Face of the enemy. Thank you. Uh, great, great episode. And you get a little behind uh, the scenes with the, the Romulan culture that's been established yet. Uh, you learn a little bit more about their, their, um, their hierarchy as well. So yeah, I, I, I absolutely loved it. All right, guys, let's get into the, ne Oh, Kyle. Yes. I just want the, the thing about the Romulans too, that I think made them so effective in next generation was the aspect of the unknown for so long about the Romulans. We were, you know, we never saw them like being this incredibly strong race, like just, but there's always something about them that made them feel threatening 
and you never quite were able to put your finger on it because you watch you watch the episodes and you're like, okay, so they're they're just a little bit more extreme Vulcans. They, you know, there doesn't anything there that feels like it should be that intimidating, and yet it's like, oh shit, it's the Romulans, and <laughs> <laughs> so it, and again that. It's kind of with the way I think the original films made the Klingons feel because we didn't know a lot about the Klingons other than they were this just this bloodthirsty race, and I think that's why the Romulans are in a way are kind of the Klingon, the, the Klingon, the early Klingons yeah. of the, the running they, generation. You're absolutely right. They they became the, the villains, the ones you have to work out, and uh, and and they were just so slimy and swarmy, and that's what I loved about them. And and I did want to uh, before I forget too uh, that. Um, the, the thing about uh, the Romulans going forward is that they, <laughs> if you remember in generations, Captain Kirk passed, uh, got killed in that, of course. And then Shatner came out with what we've nicknamed as fans called the Shatner verse, where he comes back to life. And if you don't remember the plot of that, in that, uh, uh, I think it was, I can't remember the name of the planet that he's killed on, but he's buried there. But in the way he comes back to life is that the Romulans, form an uneasy alliance with the Borg and want to reanimate Kirk to get all the knowledge that he has, all the strategy he has and use it against the Federation in an upcoming invasion. And then of course, Kirk is eventually able to break away from that and, and become his own person again. But it's those damn Romulans that'll even make an alliance with the Borg uh, it sounds cheesy, but it was a fun ride, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, those book series, especially on audio. So I did want to mention that. But guys, I want to go in, into the second away mission here because uh, I got some uh, thoughts about this. So one of the big questions I want to ask you uh, regarding these two parters is uh, what kind of impact did this two part TNG episode have on the rest of the series or in fandom? We've touched on it a little bit. A lot, of course, has to do with the culture of, of Worf and the Klingons and Worf characters going forward. And I want you guys to touch on that a little bit. But I had just a quick little story I had to share. I forgot to do it earlier when I was looking back on those episodes of uh, Reunion and um, Sins of a Father. Uh, where we find about, of course, Worf having a brother, uh, Tony Todd's character, Kern. I remember in the late 90s that they were uh, making a point to uh, re-air the entire TNG run in order on a particular station. And so I made it my mission to record it on VHS in the entire series. Do you remember this, Amy? You're giving me the finger like you remember this, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I and I was doing it like on the 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 EPP speed where you can and I was doing like the eight hour things because I really wasn't interested in quality, but I wanted to get as many episodes as I could. But I would watch the episode and then pause it during the commercials. So there was no commercials to watch when I rewatched it. And the TV guide would tell you what the next episode was. So I was following along with it. Yep, they're sticking with it. They're sticking with it. The next one. But for whatever reason, the Sins of a Father episode, they skipped. And I was like, what the hell? Why aren't they showing this in TV Guide? And what I used to do was, is I was record it, I would record it like on a good speed on a regular tape. And then I would, I had two VCRs and then I would transfer it to the main tape. I actually recorded like 50 minutes of blank space for, for Sins of a Father so that whenever it would come back on, I could patch it back in there oh and my I gosh did. that's awesome it, it didn't happen until like a couple of years later and i have no idea why they went over sins of a father it became like this ghost episode and i don't know if anyone remembers that or whatever but it pissed me off and trust me i did not miss a single episode of that wow. entire series as they ran it for like several years anyway i just had to bring that story out there wow this is these millennials and people nowadays do not understand the torture. I remember seeing that in the TV guide and like, oh my no. gosh, it's like episode after episode. I didn't think to record them, but I'm like, it was every can... night. It was every night, like around six or seven o'clock yeah. at night. And, and I was uh, like, now yeah. I can catch up on the episodes that I didn't see. You know, because yeah. I came in a little late to the game. And so I remember when they did that and I was like, all right, I can now 
you know, finally get caught up. So, oh my gosh, I love it. And that. I had a very forgiving girlfriend at the time that liked Star Trek and she watched it with me as I uh, edited out the commercials or paused it during those times. So back to the topic here, guys. Uh, touch on uh, the impact this particular two-part uh, series had throughout the rest of the series and on fandom. Uh, Kyle, I'll start with you. It's Worf. I mean, it, it, this two-parter established Worf completely and it made Worf one of the most powerful characters within TNG. I mean, and that's the difference when we talk, look at Best of Both Worlds and this is where obviously you have Picard who's already elevated. And even though Riker got elevated in Best of Both Worlds, he was Riker still. Worf just went to another level with this two-parter. And it really, I think, established the Worf character that we've got for the remainder of TNG and created the character that was so beloved, they brought him into DS9. And I think that's the impact that this two-parter had was what it did for Worf. And I also think that you have to factor in the Denise Crosby aspect of this because it was just still mind-blowing. We, we thought... At best, yesterday's Enterprise was a one one off deal. You know, all they did is just kind of, and to have her then come back in a way that obviously set it up to, for her character to be re recurring for a while was just mind blowing. And I, I remember talking to fans of Star Trek and we're like, I just, I don't, I can't wrap my head around this. It's, 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 I don't know what direction they're going in with this. What is the plan here? I never thought I'd see her on the screen like this again and then have her have her come back and be this you know and and of course the hours and hours people spent trying to figure out the whole timeline thing is a whole other aspect of it but <laughs> it, i mean i mean the truth of the matter is i think when you go back through star trek history this if nothing else might be the defining episodes for the klingons and Worf. and i think that's a, a huge deal for star trek that's a great point uh Amy, what about you? The cultural impact um, that it had for throughout the rest of the series and Star Trek in general. You know, this two-parter sort of just has it all. I mean, you've got the time travel with Sila and yesterday's Enterprise and who was this person. You have amazing guest actors and Tony Todd and the Sutherland first officer and Guinan. Um I mean, and we're in the middle of what is amazing TNG. <clears throat> great leadership, great strategy, world building with Klingons and Romulans, like everything. I just wish, like I said, Crusher, Troy, Jordy didn't really have as much to do. Um, but this one just really just, excites everything and it gives you so much to think about and to discuss and i talked about like it's sort of you've got this racial anti-android that sets up picard you've got the possibility of forming clones and fake people and then we see yeah. that in nemesis like there's things that are set up here that really do influence but building this romulan world and the strategy and the confusing and the behind the secret doors and and the Klingons who are just going to go blunt force. And, you know, it's just so world building. And then we get to see how the Federation works in between balancing, going back and forth of, well, we're going to help here, but we can't here. You know, we're going to catch them here, but we can't catch them here. Like there's lines that are drawn and we see them very clearly. And I just think that um, continuing that Klingon story is so important. We, uh, and like the, the character of the Duras family, like this is yeah. starting from season one, you know, mm -hmm. and we're still talking about them and how dominant they are. Um, <clears throat> can sort of see that in our culture and in history where we've got a dominant family look at the kennedys or the bushes you know they're a dominant family that lasts many generations so it's there's things that we can relate to um within these episodes and they're just so well written 
So well written. Speaking of dominant families, uh, you, I just want to bring up the Cardassians too. You know, mm -hmm. and seeing them in Deep Space Nine—that's that's a family there too that uh, you, know, you got to watch out for. So, <laughs> <laughs> see what I did there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys. This um, this these episodes had one of my favorite moments, and I thought it was defining because at the end of, of redemption part one you you know you you didn't know there was a doubt of is 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 wharf coming back you you had mentioned that earlier amy you know is <laughs> is he is he being written off here is he going off we didn't know exactly what was going to happen and you know and, and as we said in the last episode uh, uh michael dorn famously said like hey am i am i coming back do i need to look for more work here I, i'm wondering if he's thinking at this time going yeah, they write me off you know but it had one of my favorite moments is when he uh gets in his klingon gear and and uh he's in his his quarters and um picard comes in and then he opens up the door and you see like all these people lined up you know mm. Uh, at it at at attention guard and uh kind of like in this honor roll you know and i i just it, it yeah. hit me in the feels there just gonna yeah. say I, I love that so but yeah this 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 two-parter uh did amazing um did, did an amazing uh klingon story arc here and of course just made um not just wharf more interesting and in his character development now that you find out that he's a father uh, and you know, you just find out how honorable he is and what it means to really define that. And, um, to where, if you remember, um, um, you mentioned that Star Trek movie, um, with uh, Shinzon, right? Nemesis. That, uh, there was, um, Dina Meyer played a Romulan in that one and mm -hmm. was helping the Federation. And you never thought that Worf would say, that Romulan fought with honor. Yeah. And I just, it, it comes full circle here. Yeah. I, I go back to these episodes when I watch that movie, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, guys, as we wrap this up here, I just want to, we want to go into the, the rating part of this here. And uh, if you have any questions on how, or any statements on how this holds up for you here, but um, IMDB as of this date gave this out of 10, one out of 10 and 8.4 for part one and an 8.4 for part two. So there was no drop off there. Wow. Uh, and that, that's a high rating there. Um, mm -hmm. Just give me kind of, uh, we're going to go into the final thoughts here, guys, and then uh, give me your rating on uh, uh, the overall uh, part one and two, not for each, but overall. Uh, Kyle, let's start with you, sir. Uh, um, before my, speaking of ratings, before I give mine, um, my dating app just had uh, a couple likes, uh, the Durosses and Sela. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling like if I like either one of them back, it's not going to end well <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to give you a little higher than IMDb. I'm going to give both of these episodes an 8.9. I think. A what? I'm sorry? An 8.9. 8.9. Gotcha. Good one. I, I think you look at the historical impact <laughs> of these two episodes, how well they executed the political storylines and the moments that it had in this. I think, I, I think it's just, it, again, one of the things the next gen did right with a lot of these two part episodes is they made them significant. Mm -hmm. And when they did that, they made them a piece of history, something that changed Trek. And this one, obviously, what it did for Michael Dorn, what it did for the Wharf character, what it did for the Klingons, and how it changed the Romulan, how and how we saw the Romulans even more so here. Add in the whole Denise Crosby aspect of it, it's it's impact just on its historical impact alone, but the amazing performances of Michael Dorn, Patrick Stewart, and everybody that was in these episodes just ranks that that high for me. Well said. All right, Amy, give me your final thoughts and your ranking, overall ranking for uh, one and two. All right. Well, I did write down my uh, ranking before Kyle said his, and we are very, very close. I am giving it uh, an 8.8 .8, um, in part because I did feel that the two was a little disconnect, not as much. Um, so I'm not giving it a nine. I was thinking a nine, um, <clears throat> but I just dropped it just for that. Um, but gosh, 
And I can see why IMDb has the same scores because they're, I, you couldn't say which one's better or worse um, because in part they are so different uh, in tone. So yeah, I'm going 8.8 .8, um, for my final score. Well said. Okay. Uh, I am going to, I, I just want to say this, this really defined the Worf character for me and made me understand Klingons a lot more uh, and also just made them fascinating to me. I just think they look cool. Even little cultural things about the weapons and the wine and, and you know, how like enemies after a battle can just come in and, and party together and then go out and then start killing each other again. I mean, it's, I just, I find that's such a Klingon thing. And, and also too, I remember going to early Star Trek conventions in the mid to late nineties at the Pasadena conventions they used to have with creation. I love seeing the early uh, costumes of Klingons and hanging out with them. And there's also this thing about when you hang out with um, cosplayers as Klingons, there's always a party somewhere with these. Oh people. yeah. And I, I, I love it. As you know, Amy, you've done it. So, but uh, uh, I was actually uh, going to mm -hmm. do it. I'm going to stick with it. Um, I, I was, I'm going to go with a nine, a 9.0 for, for this on this, just because this, I just love these two parters uh, of this redemption and what it does for the rest of the series culturally and um, things that I remind myself. And also too, it, this is the first time you see the bat lift and, and I loved how it was used in this and that um, you know, I've seen people complain that know a lot about fighting weapons saying it's just, it's not a good weapon. But I got to tell you, Michael Dorn and with the help of whatever training he went through and, and uh, um, um, what's his name, uh, uh, the, the stunt guy, there's certain times where he parries with that thing and he blocks with that thing. It's just so cool. And, you know, does these little spins with it. And, you know, in the moment that he does in reunion where he's like trying to show Alexander what it is and what it means to him and how Alexander has no idea the cultural impact that this blade you know, it has as well. So anyway, I just thought, thought it was really cool. Um, but, um, uh, you know, guys, we're not done with uh, the series. And I want to give a little tease here. We've got Unification Part 1 and 2 coming up. And guys, we're not done with the Blu-rays. Look at that mm -hmm. right there. Got Unification. But what's interesting, this particular Blu-ray that I'm holding up here, I found this one in Australia. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to make a difference, Kyle. Could Unification be the most hyped two part ever of Star Trek, knowing what we knew going into these episodes, knowing Leonard was returning and because they didn't hide it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll discuss that uh, in the next next week's episode. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. That one is is very interesting. But let's go ahead and wrap this up, guys. This is the Fandom Podcast Network, and uh, of course, uh, this is the Union Federation Podcast, where we're discussing both Star Trek and the Orville. This is a lot of fun returning to TNG, discussing these very, very famous two-part episodes. Uh, and um, I want to start with you, Kyle. First of all, uh, tell us where we can find you on the Fandom Podcast Network and on social media in general. You can find me all over the place on Fan Podcast Network, and if you listen to the Fandom Podcast Network, you can find... Um, where you can, you've heard where you can find me. Um, Kevin, I, I just want to do something real quick here. here so, George, me. Um, most of you are Star Trek fans, so you listen to a lot of Star Trek podcasts. If you have not listened to the latest episode of Mission Log, a supplemental, our brother and co founder of the Fandom Podcast Network, Norman Lau, it's a focus on him. He has been going through some things. Let's just put it, put it that way health issues. And, yeah. Um, it is a very powerful episode and a very emotional episode, one that hits very close to home because Norman is family here. And yeah. I encourage any of you, no matter what you're going through, take the time, listen to that episode of Mitchell Log. It's, it's a supplemental episode. Um, they've entitled it um, Chatting, Catching Up with Norman Supplemental 79. Um, go find that episode and listen to it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's life-changing. He's family for a particular reason. He is the original co-founder with us for the fandom podcast network and uh, he helped shape this network and uh, was a contributor and a, uh, a co-host and he was a my blood of kings highlander original um, pod, highlander podcast co-host as well and 
And uh, so, yeah, check it out. It is definitely uh, something that everyone should listen to. Amy. And he is the one responsible for getting me into podcasting because there he you was go. the very first one to get me on mic. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just want to throw out, we love you, Norman. And um, if you were here in our first iteration as Discoville, that was a lot of Norman and his love of Star Trek going into that. So Union Federation would not be here without Norman Lau. So, yeah, you know, we're in your corner, Norman. We love you. <laughs> uh, Kyle, did you mention how they can find you? Okay. And as far as me, um, you can find me on Twitter at a Kyle W. You can also find me on Instagram and threads at a Kyle fandom. And you can also find me on discord at a Kyle. W. And Amy, where can we find you? I know we can find you over the BQN. Yeah, BQN uh, hosting all good things. And like I said, after Labor Day, you can find me on YouTube, co-hosting The View Screen. I'm in our Facebook group, Union Federation. Also, uh, the BQN Collective is our Facebook group over there and on Discord. Really enjoying Discord over there. Amy Nelson, 522. Awesome. Uh, my name is Kevin. You can find me, of course, on the Fandom Podcast Network, uh, of course, the Union Federation Facebook group. Uh, but on all of these socials, you can find me at Spartan underscore Phoenix. So uh, that was the subspace signals. And uh, Kyle, Amy, thank you so much for uh, joining us for uh, Redemption Part 1 and 2. Uh, looking forward to hitting unification next week. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. It's It's been a blast. If I'm not here next week, it means I hit the like button on the dating app. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Well said. Well said. All right, guys. Uh, again, uh, this is the Fandom Podcast Network. And this, of course, is a union federation. Uh, live long and prosper. And we are, without a doubt, the weirdest ship in the fleet. Till next week. <laughs>